Hi, this is the Brassic Gamer, and today we're doing a video on how to do the uh, NVRAM dead battery fix for old Sun hardware. So uh, I've got another video in the works just about Sun architecture generally, uh, but uh, this one is uh, specifically to do with when you boot up a Sun computer and you get an error which says the ID prom contents are invalid and, uh, and you can't boot the machine. Uh, so this is a way that you can put a uh, coin cell battery onto the MV RAM chip and get it working again and then you can use your Sun system. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to plug this in, fire it up and what we'll see is what would normally happen when you get an old Sun workstation um, and you want to get it working. Um, and there is a rocker switch on the back that we can use or we can use the keyboard. And one thing I've noticed with Sun workstations is they do take quite a little while for anything to come up on the screen. So at first you might be filling about with leads and you know wondering if your monitor's working. Um, so I'm just using an old Yama 15 inch one for this. Um, it does get there, but you could be left thinking, ah, oh, this machine is dead. You know, if you never get past this point, you might end up giving up on it and never actually getting it working. So you are going to need a bit of patience. Um, hello. Oh, I can hear the hard drive. There we go. So we got a click from the hard drive to say it was accessing it. And this is what we get. So it does some standard tests, sorry about the flicker. NVRAM parameters. And this is what is quite a common uh, message to get, which is the ID prom contents are invalid. And that would be either because the battery in the NVRAM chip is flat or the contents have just become corrupted. So, um, we can see from the details that the, the Ethernet, isn't, uh, Ethernet address is not correct because it should be 80, uh, sorry, 8020 because that's how all uh, Sun Ethernet addresses begin. And the host ID is actually mostly correct because EBAEAA, which is the last three bytes of the um, host ID there, does match up with the hex version of that serial number. So that's good. Um, because it would say FF, 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 FF if it was completely gone, um, which is the, the default value if it loses its information. So what I've done here is I'm going to run the MKPL program with the with these settings before. So you need an OK prompt, and an OK prompt will usually happen if the OS doesn't boot. Otherwise, you can press uh, Stop A on the keyboard during uh, the memory test to get an OK prompt. And what I've done here is, um, at the OK prompt I've done 8020, and that is the first three bytes of the Ethernet address, and then I've just made up the last three bytes, E3, E4, E5, because I read them somewhere, and because actually some machines don't have a physical MAC address stored on the machine, so I can't actually find out what the MAC address of this machine is supposed to be. Um, more recent models do actually have the uh, the last three bytes of the MAC address on the barcode, but not this one. So I'm going to make them up because it doesn't matter, as long as it doesn't clash with anything else on my network. And these bytes in the middle here, EBAEAA, are the last three bytes of the serial number. And then I do MKPL. Then what I want to do is Control D, Control R on the keyboard. Um, that completes the program. And then I do ID prom, and we can see that it has indeed changed the uh, Ethernet address. So if I power off the machine, uh, remove the power, and try rebooting again, if it may, if it holds that information, then we know the battery is actually okay. Um, if it doesn't hold it, we know the battery's flat, and we're going to have to fix it. So let's give that a go. So we have removed the NVRAM chip from the computer. And um, at this point, um, it's 
it's uh, well you can't get it wrong plugging it back in because it's keyed um, the actual holder here is keyed so you can only plug it in one way but um, when you remove the chip from the holder you do have to make sure that you plug it in back the right way otherwise you'll probably destroy the chip so if you look at one end of the uh, of the chip holder you've got a uh, semicircle there it is and that lines up with the dot on the chip so as long as we get those round the right way at the end then it will be fine so we can remove that <clears throat> and as you can see you've got an IC and then on top of that is just a block and that contains the oscillator and the battery and that's connected via some connections inside uh, the epoxy that's been stuck on here. If we look at a later generation one, and um, that's got kind of a sleeve around it, um, and you can see where I've, I did start off cutting away the epoxy in there to get the connections, but you can use a soldering iron to melt it, and that usually leaves alone the rest of the, uh, the chip itself. Um, and that's for comparison that's one of the Dallas real-time clocks from a PC quite similar so it's got the IC that you can see and then it's got like a sleeve around it um, and as I said before you can replace these quite cheaply whereas these I've not found them for any less than 30 35 quid on eBay and you can get them programmed and stuff but you know when the battery runs out you're gonna have to replace it again so we do the uh, We'll do the dirty fix instead. <clears throat> so you can use these and these are the BIOS batteries that you get from laptops. They're quite handy because obviously they've already got wires attached to them and um, you can solder those on to the connections and you know it's quite a clean solution just stick that onto the top of the chip. But again if when this battery runs out you're gonna have to do some soldering um, to to fix it again so I'm just gonna use a battery holder. I'm going to solder some wires between this and the contacts on the NVRAM chip and then we can just pop in a new battery whenever we want. Okay so this is what the chip looks like uh, with the epoxy removed and you can either scrape it away <coughs> using a knife which just takes forever. Um, that's the way I did it with this one and actually it looks quite, looks quite neat uh, in the end. I did have to cut the end off this one to get to the epoxy as you can see I've just trimmed the end didn't have to do that with this one but um, yeah so as we look at it the contacts so you keep on scraping away until you see the contacts basically and try not to break those uh, otherwise <laughs> you're a bit stuffed um, on the left we have positive on the right we have negative so as you look at it with the pins upside down positive on the left negative on the right um, and what we're going to do now is solder our battery holder to that and measure the voltage across it and fingers crossed we should be in business. Okay, so here is the finished article. Um, all I've done is piggyback the battery holder onto the MVRAM chip. Uh, I've just held it in place with some blue tack. I couldn't even be bothered to use the glue gun this time. Um, so very quick and dirty. And if it ends up looking something like a detonator from an Austin Powers movie, then you've probably done a good job. So there we have just um, soldered the wires onto either side, making sure the polarity is correct. And same thing here, um, just tinned the wires on either end and put some solder on the contacts on the chip and soldered the wires on, had them in place for a bit and there we go. I measured the voltage across the contact and it's good. So all we need to do now is put this back into the computer, reassign the correct values and fingers crossed this will work. Let's have a look. So there's the chip back in place. Um, and I have tried this already. I have to admit the first time it started up, it took forever, like even longer than it did the first time. Um, and I've noticed that you have to wait for this green light to come on and see how quickly that's come on and then straight away we get a picture on the screen so and then 
Yeah, there we go. So the Ethernet address has stuck, the host ID is correct, the serial number was always there. And now, and we've got no error messages at all, just the banner. And now it's going to boot the system that's on the disk. Unfortunately, it was booting remotely. Um, the previous user had set it up for that, so I'm going to install an operating system from fresh. So I'm, that's going to require me to install a SCSI uh, CD drive, because we've got space here for a SCSI floppy drive and a SCSI CD drive, but they're both proprietary in size. Very difficult to get hold of. Um, but you can use a standard SCSI CD drive if you wish. So uh, that would be a separate video, I think. But anyway, there we go. It works.